Hey friends, Jim Burns here. Welcome to Homeward. This is going to be a special edition of Homeward. It's one more Just Jim. So I've done a Just Jim on A Student's Guide to Sexual Integrity. I've done a Just Jim on uh, Doing Life with Your Adult Children, which by the way was the biggest download of all of our podcasts. And this one is my life message. And we're doing it right around Thanksgiving as we approach Thanksgiving because I would say in my own life that this message that I'm going to give to you today, um, just me, it's just Jim, uh, is probably the most important message of my life, of my spiritual formation, of the way I do relationships, what I want to teach my kids. And uh, so you're going to get here in just me. And uh, we call it thank therapy. Now, what's kind of funny is I've been teased for years because I talk so much about thank therapy. And I've been teased by my friends, sometimes even my family, because they go, well, you're going to need to practice thank therapy. So I'm going to teach you why this is so transformational to me. And it actually all started out of some really tough times in my life. I'm not one who really gets depressed. I'm not one who um, worries too much, uh, anxiety. You know, it drives my wife nuts because she goes, now, are you worried about this? And I go, no, not not really. Um, But I was going through a really tough time in my life. And uh, there were some reasons for that. My mom had just died. And that was a really tough. She was the woman in my life before Kathy, who was the most influential person in my life, and a great lady, actually, incredible lady. Not perfect, but a great lady. And uh, my three brothers had gone through a divorce. My dad was still in kind of, you know, full bloom, trying to figure out what was going on with him in terms of retirement and life and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, Our marriage, Kathy's and my marriage, was at a point where I, I mean, it wasn't terrible, but it was just sort of stale. We had kids running around the house, and it was busy, and uh, and our ministry was struggling financially. So I'm the president of Homeward, or was the president of Homeward at that time, and we were just having trouble financially. So all of those things kind of compiled had me somewhat melancholy. One day, Kathy said to me, you know, you need to talk to somebody. You always say, get people around you to help you walk through whatever your issues are, and you're not doing that right now. So I called a man named John Watson. John Watson was my campus life leader when I was in high school. He was one of the most influential spiritual fathers to me. And over the years, we had worked together. And so during that time, we had actually we went to lunch every Wednesday for a couple of years. We uh, spent time, even after he moved from the church I was working at, because I was a youth pastor, um, we still hung out. And if we wouldn't see each other for months, we just start. And he's a great listener. Listening is the language of love, a great counselor, a great man of wisdom. So I called him. I said, hey, John, I, I, I need some John time. So he was living in La Jolla, California. I live in Dana Point, California. And so we met halfway for lunch, and he seemed busy, maybe a little preoccupied more than, you know, what I've seen in the past. And he said, hey, I don't have a whole lot of time, but I'm, I'm anxious to see you, see how you're doing. I hadn't told him what was going on. So I kind of unloaded on him. I told him about my mom, told me about my brother, told about my brothers, told me, told, talked about Kathy. It was very you know, open and authentic, but a good conversation. Really, it was one way I was just talking. When at the end, he said, I've got a verse for you. And he said, do you know 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17, and 18? And I was like, sounds familiar, but I'm not sure I know it or not. I, so he on a napkin, he wrote 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thess, period, 5, 16, 17, and 18, and he handed it to me. I said, okay, great. I put it in my pocket. What do you got? What do you, what do you think? And more or less, he gave a couple of comments, and then he said, hey, I'm so sorry, but I'm, I'm so busy today. I've got to go. And I was like, whoa. First time in my life with John that things hadn't gone as well as I had thought. So I put the napkin again with the first Thess 5, 16, 17, 18 in my pocket, got in my car, and, and left. He actually paid for the lunch, so that was nice. But uh, I wasn't mad at him. It just it didn't work. You've been with people at times where you're hoping for a breakthrough or you're hoping for a big conversation. So I get home that night. I'd kind of forgotten about it, honestly. And Kathy goes, how was your time with John? She was all excited about that. And I said, you know, it was great, as always. I love being with John, but he really didn't help me much. He just gave me a verse. And, you know, again, no problem with verses. The Bible is the Word of God. I believe the Bible. It gives me strength. I read it every day. But in this case, um, you know, if I have a headache, I, I don't want you to give me John 3.16. Give me a couple of Advil, and I'll be fine, if you know what I'm saying. Okay. So in this case, um, Kathy said, well, what was the verse? So I pulled it out of my pocket, and I said, oh, 1 Thessalonians 5.16, 17, and 18. She said, do you want me to read it to you? And I went, Sure. 
So, you know, it wasn't like I was offended by it, but it just wasn't, to me, the answer for my melancholy spirit, depression, maybe, if you would. I don't know. Maybe I was experiencing depression, maybe not. And she said, oh, look at what it says. It says, rejoice always. And I'm like, rejoice always? My mom died. What does he mean? She goes, well, the next one you may not like either. It says, pray constantly. I go, pray constantly? Like, does he think I should become a monk? I mean, what does he mean here? I mean, I pray. I got kind of defensive. And then she goes, well, if you didn't like those two, you're not going to like this one. In everything you do, give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And I went, whoa, whoa, whoa. I wonder what that means. Am I supposed to thank God for my mom's death? Thank God for kind of some of the stuff we're going through? Thank God for, you know, the crummy finances that are going on at Homeward? Thank God for my brother's, you know, goofing up here. And uh, she goes, well, it doesn't sound like it was very meaningful to you as she closed the Bible. The next day, and I kid you not, I wake up and I read through the one-year Bible. That's what I've been doing since 1983, so before some of you were even born. And um, I do it every year. I get to 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17, 18. It's within the reading of the scripture for the next day, random. And I, And with a different heart, I said, God, you must have something for me. And he did. So I read that again, and I wrote in my journal, I wish I had kept the journal, my goal is joy, because I really wasn't experiencing joy. I mean, I can experience happiness if I'm down, you know, watch a good movie, somebody tell a joke, I love comedy, you know, all of that, but not deep-rooted joy. So I put my goal is joy, and I'm not one who also thinks the Bible is filled with cutesy little formulas, but in this case, I wrote prayer with thanksgiving equals joy. And you know what? That was really important for me. And so I had this aha over the next couple of weeks. And I want to tell you about my aha. First of all, I put my goal as joy. And then I realized that as I started studying rejoicing and the word joy, that actually over 500 times in the Bible does it say in the command form of the language, be full of joy. And so what I realized was joy is a choice. And again, joy is not just because you've eaten a good meal. Joy comes from something deeper, and I think it's a deeper relationship with God. And so I realized I was missing that, so I put joy. But I also realized that, you know what, I need to lean into joy. And I started doing something that I did honestly this morning, and I wasn't even thinking about this podcast when I woke up. But this morning I woke up, and then I said, this is the day that the Lord has made I will rejoice and be glad in it, because I've said that for years now. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. It's an act of the will. Joy is an act of the will, see? And so no matter if my day is good, bad, or if the weather is good, bad, or whether politics are going crazy or not crazy, I can rejoice because I will rejoice. And there's times when I haven't been doing as well, and I look in the mirror and I kind of go, I will rejoice today. Not my man, mind over matter weirdness, but just an act of the will. So again, I started doing that, and I still do it. Uh, this is the day. I acknowledge that God made today, and that because he made today, I'm going to be a person of joy, and so I'm going to put that in front. And then pray constantly. I have found that being a person who prays, not on as much as a lot of people who pray. But I pray every day, of course. I even had a fun experience. I might have mentioned this on the podcast one time. Uh, this weekend, we had Huxley, our our grandson, and Bodie, our one-year-old. So Huxley's four. And last time I was with Huxley, we were talking about God, and he loves to talk about God. It's kind of a cool thing. And I said, I showed him, I said, Huxley, I pray for you every day. I, and he's he can't, he doesn't know the name, he knows his name, but he doesn't know how to spell. I said, that says Huxley. And so the next time I saw him, he goes, I want to see Huxley. And I'd forgotten that I'd showed him this in my prayer journal. So I go, what? You want to see Huxley? So I thought he wanted to see himself in the mirror. So I kind of pick him up and I show him in the mirror. And he goes, no, no, I want to see Huxley. And so then he goes over to where my prayer journal is and he opens the prayer journal. He can't read it. And I go, oh, that says Huxley. So this weekend... I said, do you want to see Huxley? And he goes, yes. And I showed him, this is Huxley. This is Bodie. This is James, grandson. This is, you know, Charlotte. This is mommy, daddy. And, you know, I kind of go through this little thing. And, you know, it was kind of a cool thing, but I have found that prayer is key. And the Bible says, don't worry about anything, but in everything with prayer and thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And so what I've realized is that, you know, it's important for me to lay my burdens down to God, but also to just be thankful. So I do acts, adoration, 
where I just write down scriptures of praise, um, confession, where I confess my sins, thanksgiving, where I thank God. And it's not sexy, frankly. It's thanking God for, you know, my family and, you know, people that I know and friends. I've got Elijah here uh, in the studio today, and, you know, I've oftentimes have put his name down because he's just a cool and groovy guy. Um, and, you know, just people that I come in contact with, right? Thankful for the chance to speak in Atlanta next week, you know, those kinds of things. So, it, again, if you looked at it, you'd go, well, this is kind of boring, but it actually helps me realize reasons for being thankful. And then supplication. And that's important. Supplication means asking. And so, you know, sure, there's things that I'm requesting from God. He is my Heavenly Father. He invites me to do that. So then the next scripture, so that's prayer. The next scripture is what I really want to talk to you about. And that's in everything you do, give thanks, for this is God's will for you. And I had problems with that, I'll be honest with you. You know, am I supposed to thank God for my mom's death? Uh, she died early. She had cancer. She was in pain. Am I supposed to thank God for, you know, problems or relational problems or financial problems or things like that? And then my aha was this. It doesn't say for. It says in. And you know what? That makes all the difference in the world because I can thank God in certain situations. For example, I can thank God in my mom's death. She's not in pain. She's with Jesus. She has um, a, oh, an eternal perspective on life today. In my mom's death, she actually, I think, brought my dad closer to the Lord, where he became a Christian later, because he she was kind of setting him up with her best friend. It's kind of a fun story. And to be honest, three months later, my dad marries this woman who was my mom's best friend, who was a Christian. And over that process, dad became a Christian. So I can be thankful in all those. I still can't be thankful for her pain. I can't be thankful for you know some of this tough stuff. But in, oh, lots of things. I think in mom's death, it brought our family back together and brought our family closer, not just my, not my close-knit family, but our extended family. So, you know, there's some great things in that. Same, same with so many things, when you have a perspective. So I want to teach you a little bit about thankfulness. First of all, thankfulness is an attitude. And thankfulness is an attitude that transcends your circumstances. If you're only focusing on your circumstances, then you can go south really quick because circumstances you know, are a problem a lot of times, right? But they transcend your circumstances. And in fact, I would go so far to say this, that your circumstance may not change, but your attitude can change, and that makes all the difference in the world. You know, we play the comparison game a lot of times, and when we play the comparison game, we lose. We're not as rich, we're not as lovely, we're not as uh, handsome or, or, or beautiful. Uh, we don't have as much money, like I said, as others. We don't, we're not as spiritual. Our house isn't as nice as somebody else's house. Um, we don't, you know, it's just we can play the comparison game and lose. However, <laughs> we don't have to play the comparison game with somebody who has more. Like, for example, I was thinking about this. I was in Cuba some time ago, and um, I was so blown away by the people in Cuba. They were really happy people. They were under a regime that I wouldn't agree with in terms of the political side. Uh, they don't make a lot of money. At that point, they were making $18 a month. And yet, these were pretty amazing people. And I remember one time standing up in front of a crowd and saying, let's just look at what I'm wearing, and we're going to price out what I'm wearing. No one has ever said that I am the dress for success person, okay? But for some reason, I had like nicer clothes on or whatever. I had, when you include the running shoes that I was wearing that were, you know, 180 bucks, when you include a wallet that's $50 because it had like this leather thing, when you include a shirt that was like, I had no idea, but it was like a Ren Spooner. They're $118. I don't think I paid 118 but, you know, we just kept going up. I ended up having more money that I was wearing than what the average person in Cuba, you know, ha gets in a year, see. And yet I have the audacity to sometimes complain about finances, see? So again, my attitude can change, even though sometimes my circumstance doesn't change. And I think that's really key. Uh, there was a man named Terry Fox, and I just saw this, uh, that he, there was a celebration about him. He's died a long time ago. But he was a runner. And Terry had cancer, and he was only like 22, 23 years old. And he started running for the Canadian Cancer Society. And he would run a marathon every day, but he took Sundays off. I'm not sure he was a Christian. I didn't hear a lot of Christian verbiage. But he said, um, you know, this every day. They would put a microphone in front of him because he was raising money for the Cancer Society of Canada. He started on the east coast of Canada. He was going to the west coast. And they'd always say, how are you doing? I mean, he's sweaty. Oh, and by the way, he only had one leg. 
because the cancer had come up his leg and they had cut off his leg and he had what he called his fake leg, which was basically what he called plastic, much different. If you're a medical tech person, you're not going to call it what I just called it. But he would, he would run a marathon every day. And they would say, and even at times when I would see the blood kind of where, you know, you could see it was kind of raw, it was hard. But they would say, Terry, how are you doing? And he'd go, I don't know about tomorrow, but I know about today. And I'm glad God gave me today. And I'm going to live one day at a time. What an amazing attitude. He raised millions of dollars for the Canadian Cancer Society. There's actually a great documentary on it. But you know what's interesting is Terry Fox didn't make it. He, he got partway. He ran 2,300 kilometers. Um, and he ended up having to be sent back to British Columbia on the west side of Canada. He's in the hospital. He gets the Medal of Honor, the greatest Medal of Honor that a Canadian citizen could get. And they put a microphone in front of him. He's done chemo because the cancer was back. He's done chemo. He's done radiation. He's not looking good. His lips look blue and uh, really weak. And they said, Terry, how are you doing? And he kind of smiled. And he said, well, I don't know about tomorrow, but I know about today. And I'm glad God gave me today. (laughs) You know what? Terry Fox lived more in those 20-some years because he died right after that. But what I'm saying is his circumstance never changed, but he lived with an amazing attitude. And I want to challenge you, especially around Thanksgiving now, to be that kind of a person, to have the kind of attitude that, that he had uh, as, as he was going. So Jesus said this. Je- Jesus said, don't be anxious about tomorrow because God will take care of your tomorrow too. Live one day at a time. That's a living Bible translation. But it's a great thing to think about, that we put so much time and energy worrying about everything, when in fact, we should be probably putting more time into being thankful, grateful people. I mean, life's too short to hold a grudge. Are you holding a grudge? Uh, I hear all the time about uh, people who are in estrangement in their families. Really? Is it worth it? Um, Are you holding a grudge? What's your part in that? I'm sure somebody else has a part in it too. You know, life's too short to keep your house perfect. I can hear through the podcast world, amens to that. Um, Life's too short to let a day pass without hugging your loved ones and, and telling them that you love them, putting off Bible study, being indoors on any day, because any day can be beautiful. Life's too short to work at a job you hate or um, live in a house that you can't afford. You know, I think life's too short to focus on the mundane rather than the miraculous. So I think we have to live our life on purpose, and we do that, I think, much better when we have a thankful, grateful heart. And so that's part of my my mantra, if you would, is to be a person who has you know deep, 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 thankfulness. Martin Luther said this, and I think this is really interesting. He said, I cannot uh, help the birds that fly over my head, but I can keep them from uh, landing on my head and roosting on my, in my hair. And you know what? He, he's right that you know, we have to be more careful on that. So again, thankfulness is an attitude that we can work on and that we can change, but we have to do it proactively and intentionally and become more aware of it. Secondly, we have to, what I call practice thank therapy. That's the word I said at the beginning. So um, here's the deal. We have good habits and we have bad habits. So if I had a bad habit of biting my fingernails for three weeks, it becomes a habit for a lifetime. And if I did it for another three weeks, it literally solidifies it for a lifetime. And it's hard to break that habit. Well, what about the habit that we have of thankfulness, because we can have the habit of grumbling and complaining and going negative, or we can have a habit that literally can cause us to be more thankful, grateful people. And I say, I I call it practicing thank therapy. You know, I learned this one time, I I used to do radio, and um, I loved my time with radio, because here on the podcast, I mainly interview people, and I love interviewing people. I love getting to know them. I love getting to hear their story. I love getting to hear their principles, and that's what we do around here. And one day I had a woman named Johnny Erickson Tata come into our studio. Johnny, uh, as you might know, most of you might know who she is. She's kind of a hero in our Christian world. But, uh, you know, when she was young, she was a teenager. She had an accident. She was she dove into the Chesapeake Bay, and uh, she became became confined to a wheelchair. And what some people don't know is the back story of her pain and just how hard it is, but yet she's an amazing, radiant person. So she's wheeled into the... Well, she actually had a fancy wheelchair, so she's in this wheelchair kind of coming in. Her husband's there and kind of an entourage, if you would. And we had papers ready to go asking her questions about her life and, and whatnot. 
And as she walked in, I was just so overcome with this amazing faith and also attitude of this amazing woman who I knew was in pain. And I said to her, first time I put the just the paper aside, probably freaked out my executive producer. And I said, Johnny, how do you manage? How do you manage to be so radiant in the midst of being confined to a wheelchair? I mean, think of the struggles that life has been. And, and, and she's more my age now, so she's been through a lot. I said, how do you manage with pain? And, and she paused. And this was on radio, so they couldn't, like, fix it. <laughs> and so there's this long, dramatic pause. I go, what is she going to say? And she said, Jim, I've had to learn that in everything I do, I give thanks. And that that's actually God's will for me. She quoted that scripture that I had mentioned. And she said, it's become my reflex reaction. Thankfulness is my reflex reaction. See, And so I want to help you think through making thankfulness your reflex reaction. So I call it thank therapy. And here's what I do. It's really simple. I did it today. I did it in my journal today. I write down 20 reasons why I'm thankful. And, you know, I mentioned already some things. It's not big stuff, okay? But I'm thankful for um, so many things that go on in life. I, I remember a time Kathy and I were um, doing a, a, what would you call it, a week long at a place called Mount Hermon in Northern California. It's just, it's up in the Santa Cruz Mountains. You're six miles from the beach. You're up in these mountains. It's a beautiful place. And it had just been an amazing time. And then we're going to leave, and we're going to spend one day in Carmel, which is on Highway 1. If you've not been to Highway 1, obviously a lot of you, even in other countries, listen to this podcast. But Highway 1 is, in my mind, the most beautiful road in the world. I've never seen a more beautiful road. It's coming down the coast of Northern California into Southern California. Mainly, no buddies around, but Carmel is at the beginning of it. And so we stayed at a neat hotel, and we um, ate fun food, one of our favorite Italian restaurants that every couple of years we go to. And it was just so good, great long walks, great conversations, long romance, great food, all, all that kind of stuff. I think I mentioned great food twice, so I'm kind of that foodie guy. So as we're driving down the road to go towards Southern California, and it's going to be this great drive, Kathy looks at me and she goes, you know what, Jim, I think you're getting a double chin. And I kind of laugh because I'm like, oh, man, we've just had all this great time together. And now she's, you know, ripping on me saying I'm getting a double chin. Now you're wanting to look on the YouTube channel to see if I actually have a double chin. I realize that because now nobody is, you know, you're probably moving from the podcast platform that you have to our Homeward YouTube channel because you go, does he have a double chin? I still don't think I do, but maybe I do. Um, but I was so mad at her. I, it was it was a trigger for me. It's something I work on. It's something that I don't always do right. And I was so mad, and so I got quiet. And uh, so she kind of didn't pay any more attention, and she's looking out at the road. And, you know, there's just it's beautiful scenery. And she's like, oh, my gosh, I think I see dolphins out there. The water's amazing. Look at it coming upon those rocks in the water and all these things. And she goes on and on. And for me, I'm just, like, mad. So finally, it's as if God speaks to me. And he didn't. I didn't hear an audible voice, but what I heard in my spirit was practice thank therapy toward Kathy. <laughs> so... I took a deep breath, and I'm, I'm not talking to her at all. I mean, not that I'm not talking to her, like, because I'm just super angry at it. It was just not the moment. And I said, mumbling, not out loud, but in my heart, thank you, God, for Kathy, you know, with my teeth gritted. And then I said, thank you for uh, the amazing wife that she's been, and for really the wonderful time that we had at Mount Hermon, the wonderful time we had at Carmel. Thank you that she does speak truth into my life a lot. Thank you for this. Thank you. And I just started talking about things I was thankful for. Thank you for the amazing mom she is. Thankful for the sacrifice she's made at Homeward all these years. I mean, there were years when we were paying salary on our credit card and not taking money so that we could, you know, pay for the staff so they never went without. But, you know, she's that's her sacrifice. I mean, I'm that guy. I don't care. I could sleep on a bench. But with her, she had to put up some sacrifices all these years. Thank you for this. Thank you for that. And all of a sudden... I found myself starting to sing, and I was singing some worship songs that we had just sang at this Christian conference, and I looked out, and then I kind of moved to, thank you, God, for, you know, the white line in the road, because it keeps us from, you know, hitting each other. Thank you for the sun and the moon, the beauty of the stars, the beauty of creation. Your creation is awesome, and, you know, I kind of sang another song, thought of some scripture, and all of a sudden, literally, I found my spirit different. She still, and I hadn't talked about this uh, double chin business, 
And so I, I just kind of moved over in the seat. I don't recommend doing this on a windy road like Highway 1 in California. I put my arm around her. I gave her a kiss, kind of an awkward kiss on the side of her lips because uh, she's not looking at me. And I just said, I love you. And she just looked at me and she goes, oh, I thought you were probably mad at me because I'd said you had a double chin. I go, we'll talk about that later, <laughs> right? But the point being is my, my circumstance hadn't changed, but my attitude had. And it was because I practiced thank therapy. So I want you to do that. I honestly want you to do, if, if you can't do 20 like I do, do three. If you can't, if you can do more than three, write five, write 10, whatever. But on a regular basis, write down reasons why you are thankful. And I think it changes things. And I call that thank therapy. And then I would just simply say in closing that really the reason we are thankful is because of what God has done for us. And so thankfulness comes out of an abundancy of knowing and loving Jesus Christ, who is the ultimate reason for our thankfulness. I was just watching the World Series a while back, and people were standing in the, you know, in the stands, and they're screaming and yelling. And then, you know, you go to church sometimes, and it feels boring. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, you know, I was happy because the Dodgers won this last World Series. But also, you know, I'm more happy that Jesus Christ has come into my life, changed my life, changed the trajectory of my family, changed the trajectory of my life, and has saved me from my sins. And I now have an eternal home with Jesus in heaven. That's reason to be thankful, right? And yet sometimes we who are Christians are mumblers and compl- and complainers in the Father's house. So for me, I have to constantly be reminded that, well, the Bible says very, very strongly that, you know, God loves us so much that he gave his only son so that we might have life eternal. He demonstrated his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, all throughout the scripture, we have these kind of things. And really, that's the ultimate reason for our thankfulness. So as you approach Thanksgiving, don't make it just a day. Make Thanksgiving a season and make that season a better season for your attitude. And again, I wish I could tell you that all of your circumstances could be changed, but I can't. But your attitude can change, and that makes all the difference in the world. Thanks for hearing me out. You had to listen to me for this whole time instead of you know the inter- typical interview. We'll go back to an interview next time. But um, it's just something that was on my heart. I wanted to share it with you. I'm so deeply grateful for the people who listen to our podcast, to the people who not only listen to our podcast, but to the people who also watch our Homeward YouTube channel so they see our, uh, well, not my lovely face, but you see the, well, you see my lovely face. It's not so lovely. Or, uh, you know, the faces of the people that we interview. So anyway, such a privilege to be with you. Let others know. Please subscribe if you haven't subscribed. Um, Let us know what you like. Let us know what you don't like. Um, We're here for you. I read every email. So you can do it at info at homeward.com, and it'll get right to me, and I'll read it. And uh, again, thanks so much for listening today. And if I don't talk to you before, I hope you have an incredible, happy Thanksgiving and get preparing as you prepare your heart for the most amazing season of all. God bless. Thanks.